If you were here last week, you'll, um, you'll know that this is the beginning of our, of our Exodus series. Six weeks talking about a journey to freedom. And freedom's a word that we throw around a lot. It's something that gets used a lot in our context, in our culture, our community, even worldwide, right? There's, there's this kind of this move, this movement towards freedom. But I'm not sure that that, that movement towards freedom is already, always really clearly defined. So as we journey together towards this understanding of freedom, I asked you um, last week to answer two questions. First one was, in what areas of my life is God asking, um, do I need God to bring me freedom, right? So in what areas of your life are you looking for freedom from God, with God? Second one is, in what ways might God be calling me to help bring his freedom to others? Well, um, I was really oh, almost overwhelmed, but encouraged by the number of responses. Uh, last week, 92 cards got turned in at the end of the week, which I was so cool. I spent basically all day Monday um, doing what I said I would do. I prayed, I listened, I planned. And then I tried to like, take the 92 responses and I tried to kind of distill them down a little bit. And I promised you I wouldn't share them individually. Most of you, almost all of you, um, gave anonymous answers. But I wanted to distill them down and kind of give you an idea of um, the things that we as a church are waiting on God for in terms of freedom. So here's the top five results um, that you guys shared this past week, places where you need freedom in your life. Number one, worrying about what others think of me, nine out of those 92 responses. Addictions or bad habits, eight. Low self-esteem or self-worth, seven. And then there's a, a three-way tie for four and five. So we have anxiety, regrets, financial stress or fear, doubts about God or faith, pain, and pride and self-reliance. Can I tell you something? And I mean this. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your transparency. That's the one thing I want to tell you. The second thing I want to tell you, friends, you're not alone. You're not. In this journey to freedom, I, out of the 92 cards, I, I think the most that I received that didn't have one thing that they were asking God for freedom for was three, maximum. So 89 out of the 92 of us are seeking God in a specific way for freedom in our lives. Thank you for your honesty, but please know you're not alone. And then I, I took the second question and I distilled that down a little bit and tried to figure out our top fives. There's a little more commonality here um, in the top five where we feel called to bring freedom. So here they are. Number one, sharing God's love to those around me. That's a good one for a church. Amen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Been listening. Okay. Uh, number two, this is the one that, that, that like stunned me and encouraged me the most out of these responses, honestly. It says, unsure, but I'm willing to learn. There's a huge portion of individuals that, that just said, hey, like, I don't know. In fact, I, I want to draw your attention to something. Number one is kind of like the same as number two. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just want to show people God's love. I'm not sure how, but right. And so this journey towards freedom is is beginning to ask God for specifics about what it means for you personally to bring God's love to people around you. And so that's, if you combine one and two, almost half of us are going, okay, God, whatever you want me to do, I want to do. Number three, sharing my story with those that are struggling. This was a really neat theme. Some of you have discovered this. Some of you in your own journey to freedom have, went, have come to the realization that like, wow, God brought me through that so that I could help bring others through their pain as well. In very specific ways of, of bringing freedom through your own story. Number four is caring for others, serving them, and praying for others. Like, so if you take all those top five, um, there's this, I would say, tangible hunger in the context of our church and community to understand, okay, in what ways might God be calling you to bring freedom to those around you? And last week, uh, we kind of left off with the, the, the beginning of the story, the Exodus story, the people of Israel and Moses. We talked about Exodus um, being a story of, of more than just freedom from slavery, right? But almost freedom from an identity that, is, that was false of the people of Israel. And so what was happening in this context is that, that Israel was needing freedom. Moses was living in his own form of captivity, and God was already calling Moses back into a relationship with, with himself. But our primary question, today's primary question, 
that we have in regards to this journey to freedom is this. And I believe this is what God wants to ask of us today. Will you trust me? Will you trust me? Last week's point was like before Israel even asked for freedom, God was already preparing a way. And so we have a God that's so much bigger than, than the chains that we're kind of living under right now. So much bigger than the doubts and fears. So much bigger than the worry and anxiety. And we're believing that God's already begun to put a form of rescue in place. But the question that, that is burning on my heart today as we spend time in Exodus chapter 5 through 10. Will you trust, not me being Josh, but God is asking us, will you trust me? God asked that of Israel. God asked that of Moses. God asked that of Aaron. God asked that of the elders of Israel. Will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you trust me? And I just want to remind us where we, where we left off last week, right? So Israel had cried out to God. God hears the cries of Israel. He had already invited, not just invited, but called and set aside Moses as the form of, of freedom, as a methodology towards freedom. And then Moses accepts the call, right? Not just verbally, but then he steps out and he heads back to Egypt and he tells the elders about the crazy plan, right? This murderer, fugitive, wilderness wanderer is gonna come back and help rescue them from the largest and most powerful nation in the world at the time, right? And do you remember what the elders did? The response of the elders in Israel, they worshiped. They bowed down and they worshiped. So, um, great start, okay, let's just put it that way. Like Israel has this fantastic start. Okay, yeah, that's kind of a weird um, you know, rescue plan, God, but, but we're gonna believe, we're gonna worship, we're gonna, we're gonna honor you. But then what happens? Let's take a look at Exodus chapter five. If you have your Bibles with me, you can follow along. In Exodus chapter five, I'm reading from the New International Version. It'll also be on the screen. We're gonna to attempt to cover five chapters in about uh, 26 minutes, okay? So uh, forgive me if I go a little fast today. But this theme happens over and over and over again in these five chapters, Exodus five through 10. Will you trust me? Will you trust me? And so the, the elders start out pretty good in trust and worshiping God based on this plan that Moses shares with them. And then what happens? Exodus chapter five, verse one, after Moses, afterwards, this is immediately after they had met with the elders, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Verse two, Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? <laughs> Isn't that a powerful question? Like, who is this God? I mean, think about this for a minute. In Egypt, Pharaoh was God. There was none higher. All the other gods were, were subservient to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh's response is only natural. Who is this Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. That's a pretty simple answer, right? Like, I have no idea who this God is that you're trying to get me to understand, and I'm already God, so I, why should I let my people go, let these people go? And then they, this being Moses and Aaron, then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. Okay, so Moses already kind of knows the plan. Do you, is he being like 100% honest with the plan? I don't know. The, like, you start to see a little bit of the trust factor here for Moses. It's like... He's not being completely transparent with Pharaoh when he says, hey, let us go have a festival in the wilderness, right? Like, he knows God's calling them to the promised land. So Moses trusts in this first chapter, this first couple of verses of five, they start to falter. Even just the way that he speaks to Pharaoh is a little bit different, right? He's, he's, tr he's having trouble trusting God's plan of freedom. Verse four, but the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to work. Then Pharaoh said, look, look, the people of the land are now numerous and you are stopping them from working. Makes a lot of sense. No need for explanation. Verse six, that same day, so Pharaoh responds, 
And he gives the order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Do not reduce the quota. Hmm. Not only did Pharaoh not respect Moses' plan, Pharaoh did not respect Moses' God. And so he says, well, if you're going to complain, let's make it harder. For they are lazy. That is why they're crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to the lies. You ever been there? <laughs> you ever been so caught up in your own fear and worry and anxiety that even just the thought of freedom just brings more fear and worry and anxiety. We get so accustomed to the fear that we know, the worry that we know, that we can't even imagine a life without it. And this is Pharaoh's response. Let's make it harder. That way they won't even think about freedom. Verse seven, then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh. Oh, this is verse 15. I skipped down a couple of verses, sorry. So this is what Pharaoh responds, doesn't respect Moses' plan, doesn't respect Moses' God. He's, he's trying to make things harder so that the people will begin to even ignore God himself, won't even think about freedom. And then the Israelite overseers went to appeal to Pharaoh, verse 15, why have you treated your servants this way? So they're just trying to understand what's going on. Your servants are given no straw, and yet we are told make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. That's kind of bold. Verse 17, Pharaoh said, lazy. That's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get back to work. You will not be given any more straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. Verse 19, the Israelite overseers realized that they were in trouble when they were told you are not to reduce the number of bricks required for you for each day. Do you understand what's happening in this, this chapter? In Israel's journey towards freedom, and their pursuit of the exodus, things got harder before they got better. I don't know about you and I, but many times in my life over the years, I thought to myself, well, God's gonna make it better. And then when God doesn't immediately make it better, I begin to doubt and worry and fear. There's this kind of like, false understanding that just because we cry out to God, it's gonna immediately get better. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. In this context, it doesn't. It gets worse before it gets better. And therefore, Israel is left with a choice. You remember that question we started out with? Will you trust me? Will you trust me? Things get worse before they get better. And the question that God continues to level to Israel is, will you trust me? So let's see, do they trust them? What do you think they do? This is a trick question, okay. <laughs> Exodus 5, 20 and 21, it says, when they left, this is the Israelite elders, when they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hands to kill us. Will you trust me, ask God? At the first sign of trouble, Israel begins to turn their back on God. At the first sign of hardship, yes, they've had 400 years of hardship, but as soon as it starts to get a little bit harder, they begin to like question God's plan, God's authority. They start to lose their trust, kind of like Moses did, right? In Exodus 5. And so here's Moses, crazy plan, the most powerful nation on earth, the most powerful individual on earth by all accounts in that period of time. He's making things worse for Israel and Israel begins to complain. So what do you think Moses did? Let's take a look. Moses is left with a choice too. His choice is the same. Will you trust me? Ask God. Exodus 5, and 23. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on his people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak your name, he has brought trouble on his people, and you have not rescued our people at all. All right, so you see the progression. 
Moses starts out with Pharaoh. Pharaoh makes things worse. Israel goes to Pharaoh. The elders then complain to Moses. And then what's Moses do? He starts complaining to God. He starts doubting God's plan. He starts doubting what God has for him and for the people of Israel. And so imagine yourself as God for just a minute. These people that have been in slavery for hundreds of years have no way out of their slave culture. They have no way, no form of freedom whatsoever that they can gain for themselves. They cry out to you as God and ask for your help. You put a plan in place that was already in place probably for decades, right? But then you help them understand the plan. You invite them to trust you and at the first sign of trouble, they turn their backs on you. At the first sign of trouble. Both the Israelites and Moses turn their back on God. But I am overwhelmed and so deeply blessed by God's response. Because God has a choice too, right? In that moment, God has a choice. Is he going to continue with the plan? Is he going to continue to love and rescue and bring freedom? Or is he just going to like, okay, fine, you give up, I give up and walk away, right? God has the right to do that, but he doesn't. Let's see what he does. He asks this question, the same question. Now, I, I can't give you a chapter and verse for this, but, but his response is basically saying, will you trust me? If you look at Exodus chapter 6, verse 1, this is God's response. Then the Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. So God's first response to Moses' complaint is that God shows Israel the plan. He didn't have to. Right? God didn't have to show Israel and Moses the plan, but he gives them even more detail than ever before. If you go back to look at Exodus chapter 6, verse 1, that second half of that verse God reveals the ultimate plan, not just like getting Israel out of Egypt, but he says how it's going to happen. He says that Pharaoh will literally say, go, get out of here, like, like driving them out. He'll be so overwhelmed with the power of God that Pharaoh will literally drive them out of his own country, these people that he's refusing to let go. So God, in response to Moses complaining, God, in response to Israel's doubt, he humbles himself, which he doesn't have to do. Remember who he is, right? He's God. And not only does he remind Moses of the plan, he even gives Moses a little bit more detail around the plan, right? Hey, Moses, trust me, because my goal is to get Pharaoh to literally drive them out of the nation. Then the second thing that God does in response to Israel's doubts, God showed Israel his personhood, right? Not just his plan, but then he reminds Israel, who he is. Exodus chapter 6, verse 2. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. Right? Exodus 6, verse 2. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known unto them. Okay? So God is, is reminding Moses, hey, this is, I am the God that called you originally, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I, I am also this God that you haven't even seen yet. <laughs> this, is, this is God's way of saying, hey, you don't know me the way that you think you know me. And this is the first word. This is that same word that, that, that Moses, this name that, that God uses with Moses right here in Exodus chapter 1. I am the Lord. That is the same Yahweh, Yahweh. Y-H-W-H, that's the same thing that, that he told Moses back at the burning bush when Moses said, who are you, right? He says, I am the Lord. Do you know what that literally means? Everybody thinks it means to be, right? Yeah, and that's true. But literally it means to bring being into existence. To speak being, in, to, to like, to be the being of beings, right? To be the only becomer of beings, <laughs> And so in response to Moses' doubt and Israel's doubt, God shares the plan and then God shares his personhood. And then he goes on a little bit further, right? When you look at verse, 
Verse 4, he said, I did not make myself fully known to them, but verse 4, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. God's saying, not only am I the God of all gods, not only am I the one who brought all things into being, not only am I the one that promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob a land of their own, but I have heard the cries of my people and I have covenanted with you. So God, in response to Israel's doubt, he reminds them of who he is, his character, his eternal character, that he's always been and always will be faithful. So God reminds them of the plan. Then God shows Israel his personhood. Then the third thing that God does in response to these doubts, God showed Israel his power, okay? So we just ended at Exodus 2, uh, 6, verse 5. And he reminds them, he said, hey, don't forget, I've made a covenant to you. And then he reestablishes the covenant in Exodus 6, 6. Look at this. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am Yahweh. There's that word again. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and a mighty axe of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. And then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out, of, out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land that I swore with uplifted hands, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give to you as possession I am the Lord. Okay, so you have to understand something about these three verses. This is covenantal language. Because God starts out by saying who he is, right? He's like signing his name at the top of the covenant. You've seen that if you've ever bought a house or a car, right? You have to fill your name in at the top and then you sign it at the bottom. So this, this is actually kind of like what God is doing with the Hebrew people again, with, with Moses right now. He's, he's re-entering into the covenant. And he's saying, I am the Lord. That's at the beginning, right? In verse 6. And then how does he end it? In verse 8, I am the Lord. And then in the middle, do you know how many times God says, I will? Seven times in a row. Many scholars believe that, that the number seven rep represents perfection throughout Scripture. And so by saying seven times in a row, I will set you free from being slaves in Egypt and I will redeem you and I will take you for I am the Lord and I will bring you. Like seven times God is saying it is his power that will bring the freedom that they so desperately long for. And his power, he reminds us by saying it seven times in a row, is perfect. So God, in response to Israel's fear, in response to Israel's doubt, in response to Moses complaining, he shares his plan, he shares his personhood, he reminds Israel of his power and says, I will be the one that rescues you. There is no other plan, no other power. Do you hear the whisper of God? It's not written in scripture, but do you hear that whisper? Hey, will you trust me? Will you, will you trust me? Will you trust my plan? Will you trust my personhood? Will you trust my power? Will you trust me? So this same God enters into, again, a covenantal relationship with Israel, reminds them of that covenant. He tells them about the plan and his personhood. Then he tells them about his power and reminds them that he's in a covenant with them. And then the fourth thing that God does in response to Israel's doubt and fear God showed Israel his partners. This is interesting. Because if you look, I'm, I'm not going to read through it all. But when you get to the, the second half of Exodus chapter 6, there's this long genealogy. You see that? It's not that it isn't important. It's just not important for our moment right now. But there's this long genealogy. And Moses, and God goes into this, you know, like full, long life Understanding God's creating the like family tree of both Moses and Aaron. And it seems kind of weird, right? Just like in the middle of this covenantal relationship as, as God's trying to call Israel out by his power. It just seems like a weird place to put Moses' genealogy, right? It's, it's like, did he swab his lips and then he just like, you know, sent him in for the DNA test or what? Like, but God, what God's doing here is 
not only is God inviting people into his plan and his personhood and his power, he's saying, I have partnered with you. And just in case there's any doubt, just in case Israel doubts, just in case Moses doubts, just in case Aaron doubts, just in case any of the Israelite elders doubt, God is going, this is my real people. These are my partners. And then he says in Exodus 6, 26 and 27, it was this Aaron. It was this Moses. After sharing the genealogy of these two men, he says, it was this one. These two people are my partners. It was this Aaron and this Moses to whom the Lord said, bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. This same Moses and Aaron. Do you see twice, two different times, God's reinforcing, I have called you. These are my partners. I am the same God from the yesterday, today, and forever. I'm the God who does not change. I am Yahweh, he says. To the people of Israel. This is my plan. This is who I am as a, as a God, as a person. It will be done through my power with my partners, Moses and Aaron. What an incredible response from God to Israel's doubt. Think about this for a minute. Israel's worry and doubt and anxiety and fear, they're literally complaining. They're, they curse Moses. And Moses comes this close to cursing God, instead he kind of curses himself. He's like, what am I? Well, just kill me, God, basically is what he's saying. And God's response is such deep compassion. God's response is such deep love. God's response is, is just like this wooing of these people back to himself. Reminding them of who he is and who his plan, what his plan is and what his power is and who his partners are. It's just this amazing response that God has. All asking the question, will you trust me? Will you trust my plan? Will you trust my personhood? Will you trust my power? Will you trust the partners that I have established? You see, brothers and sisters, as, as we walk towards freedom, as, as we deal with fear and anxiety and worry and habits and regret over our past and just like trying to figure out what it means to be who we are apart from all these unfair and unhealthy expectations around us. God's just asking over and over and over and over. Will you trust me? Will you trust me? I can't answer that question for you. I won't answer that question for you. But this is God's questions question for Israel, and this is God's question for us. Will you trust me? Now, we're going to go through the ten plagues in about seven minutes. So hold on. Because what God does next is fascinating. Right? What God does next is just absolutely fascinating. He goes, like, to be honest with you, it, it does get worse before it gets better, right? The plan gets gets a little more convoluted and harder for the, for the Israelite people at the beginning. And God keeps reminding his people about his plan and his purpose and his, and his power. So if you look at Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, I don't have it up on the screen, but then God comes back. God takes a hiatus, right? Like all of chapter 5 and 6, God is just taking a break and he's saying, okay, before we jump back into this plan, I need to remind you of something, right? This is who I am. This is my plan. These are my people. It will be done by my power, right? And then all of a sudden, God, in, he calls Moses and Aaron again in Exodus 7, verse 1, and he reminds them, hey, guys, this is still the plan. Nothing's changed. So God calls them back again. And Exodus 7, 14 the plagues begin. So God warned. God warned Israel. God warned Pharaoh. All the way at the beginning, Moses warned Pharaoh about the coming of the plagues. In Exodus 7, 14, they start. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. Will you trust me? 
Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile and take your hand and staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the mountains, in the wilderness. But until now, you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this, you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams of the canals, the ponds, and all the reservoirs, and they will turn into blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, and even the vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just what the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of the Pharaoh. We forgot one more. I want to go back to that. Moses and Aaron did just what they thought was right. Moses and Aaron did just what they thought was, was good. You see this journey towards freedom that God is calling us on? It requires us to wrestle with whose plan are we going to follow? And so Moses and Aaron, they they followed God's plan. They did just as the Lord commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials struck the water of the Nile. and All the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died and the river smelled so bad the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their own secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart became hard. There's a theme here. There's a theme here that gets revealed again over and over and over again as God asks the question will you trust me over and over and over again Pharaoh responds with a hardened heart Pharaoh refuses to see the person of God the power of God the plan of God and his heart grows harder and harder with each of these plagues Verse 23, instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not take even to this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water because they could not drink the water of the river. There's this pattern that gets established in the 10 plagues. It's a call and a response. A call and a response. A call and a response. God calls out and says, will you trust me? And Pharaoh responds with a hardened heart. God calls out and says, will you trust me? And Pharaoh responds with yet a more difficult and and more hardened heart. This goes on back and forth and back and forth. And if you notice something in in these 10 plagues, they they start out, the first three, they kind of start out distressful, right? Like that's kind of weird. Water's turned into blood, but we can still dig and get some water. It says right there, you know, that they dug trenches along the Nile and found some clean water. So it starts out just kind of an annoying play, right? Like, that's annoying. But then it gets worse. Um, Theologians believe that that each of these first three plagues, the one with blood and the one with frogs and the one with gnats, they were actually God's way of of casting judgment on three different Egyptian gods. Did you know that? So um, there's a god and goddess of the Nile River that was Hapi, and Isis, right, are the, are the two names of the, of the god and goddess that the, that the Egyptians bound down to at the Nile River. And so by God turning the river into blood, he's saying, your gods are worthless. That's what he's saying. He's, he's literally calling judgment on these gods. And then we go to the next one and, and, um, and chapter 8, verse 1. And then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I'll send a plague of frogs on your whole country. Okay, why frogs? There's, a, there's an Egyptian god in that time period called Heket. And it was um, considered to be the god of fertility. Her head was actually considered a frog. She had a frog's head and a, and a human body. And so here again, God is saying to the people of Egypt, you're trusting in the wrong God. Hopi and Isis, the God and goddesses of the Nile. Haket, the God of fertility with with the frog head. I can make frogs come out of your ears, basically, is what God's saying. 
Verse 2, if you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on the whole country. Okay, this, this is another theme that happens throughout these, um, these ten plagues. Do you know how many times God warns Pharaoh of what's coming? Seven out of those ten plagues, God warns him. He just says, hey, it's coming. Here's your chance. Friends, in our journey towards freedom, God often puts these warnings in our hearts. God often puts these warnings in our path. God often puts maybe a still small voice or a verse or a friend or maybe not so small, like a big issue that's in your life that you can't ignore, but you try to ignore it anyway. You see, this pattern that God is establishing with Egypt throughout these plagues is God's way of saying, I'm calling out to you and I'm even warning you. Many of us, the reason that we're so bound up the reason that we're so oppressed, the reason that we're so caught up in addiction and fear and worry and anxiety, most often is because we didn't heed the warning sign. And neither does Pharaoh. So whether it's the God Hapi or Isis or Heket, the third one that, that we come to is that um, in Exodus chapter 8, verse 16, then God goes and it's, it's time to bring the gnats down, right? So Pharaoh doesn't listen to the warning about the frogs. The frogs come. Pharaoh attempts some sort of like sorcery through his magic artist. They can produce it. And so he's like, ah, oh, that's fine. If my guys can do it, I can trust my guys. Right? He begins to trust the word of those around him. And then Moses comes back. Moses comes back to Pharaoh again after his hard heart. And we look at verse 16. It says, since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere, this is the third plague. The magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not listen just as the Lord had said. So there's a change here. At, the third, at this third plague, something changes. Because for the first two, Pharaoh's Egyptians, they were like, you know, his, his smart men. Right? His magicians, his sorcerers, they were like, oh, we can do that. Don't worry. We'll take care of that. There's nothing special about that, God. But when this third one comes, this plague of the gnats, it so overwhelmed them that they said, hey, Pharaoh, you better, like, better check yourself. Right? We can't do this. But Pharaoh's heart stays hard. This third, this third plague that God sends, it was actually God's judgment against the Egyptian god of the desert known as Set. S-E-T. And so literally what God does, he takes the dust that is in all of Egypt and he turns it into gnats. And each time, each time, there's this kind of call and response from God. Will you trust me? Pharaoh's heart gets hard. Will you trust me? Pharaoh's heart gets hard. Will you trust me? Pharaoh's heart gets hard. And it's getting worse, isn't it? The problems are getting more. And then you get to the second half of these kind of plagues. We get into the fourth plague and then it becomes flies. And then, then the livestock and then the boils. Each time, right? Theologians say that, um, that the reason that God was bringing judgment against Egypt with the flies is that there was this God named Uachit. I didn't know that one. The Egyptian God named Uachit who was the sacred God of the flies. This is, seems like a really complex system of, of religion. But God is saying, I'm bigger than every single one of your gods. I'm bigger than every single one of these other gods that you trust in. Bigger than Hapi, bigger than Heket, bigger than Set, bigger than Yuachi. Will you trust And then when we get to the livestock in, in chapter 9, this is, this is God's judgment against the Egyptians because they trust in their possessions, right? And what, what I failed to mention here is that these, the second half of these, um, these plagues, they don't happen to Israel anymore. Did you know that? For the first three, those first three being the water that's turned into blood, the frogs and the gnats, Israel experiences them as well. 
right? They're going through the same pain. And all of them are basically, God's asking the question both of Egypt and of Israel, will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you trust me? Then when we get to the fourth plague, it changes. The Egyptians have flies all over them, all over their animals, all over their house. But when you go to Goshen, the city that belongs to the Israelite people where the slaves are, there's no flies. The livestock all die of the Egyptians. So much so that, that Pharaoh sends out people to find out whether or not the Israelites have lost their livestock as well. And then the boils cover the bodies of the Egyptians while the Israelites walk around free. We know from history that the Egyptians were some of the most prideful and arrogant individuals in history. And one of their, their things that they were most proud about is how clean they were. So, so to get boils on their bodies, right? A representation of like sickness was, was God saying, I'm bigger than even your biggest pride. I'm bigger than the biggest livestock. God's saying, I'm bigger than the biggest God the biggest thing that you trust in. And Israel begins to experience that freedom, right? That God's providing. Because they're not dealing with the boils. They're not dealing with dead livestock. They're not dealing with flies covering their houses. And then in the last section of the plagues, the plagues become dangerous. Moses' heart continues to harden. Isn't this a bit of our journey as humans? Aren't we pretty thick-headed in our own bondage? Doesn't it take some deep pain at times to bring us out? And this is exactly what Pharaoh experiences. As he goes from the water that turns into blood, to the frogs, to the gnats, to the flies, to the livestock, to the boils, and then hail comes. And locusts come and start like destroying everything. They and there's this other thing that you need to know that, that happens in the middle of this whole interchange between, between Moses and Pharaoh. On numerous occasions, Pharaoh begins to try to bargain with God. He's like, well, why don't you just like, he says to Moses, why don't you just take your people and, and then like make your sacrifices here in Egypt so I don't have to let you go. And then he says, well, why don't you just take all your men out into the wilderness, but leave your women and children behind, thinking that Moses would never run away, right? Pharaoh begins to bargain with God when he sees he's not getting out of the system, right? When, when he understands the power of God, he begins to try to, like, compromise with God. But I have to tell you, it's probably one of the most dangerous things that Pharaoh can do. Is to, is to try to, to bring God into some sort of compromise. You and I, we want freedom, but we wanted it on our terms, don't we? So often we want to be free, but we want it to, to be our plan or our power. And over and over and over again, each of these plagues, God is saying to Israel and God is saying to Pharaoh, will you trust me, my plan? And Pharaoh just keeps bargaining with God. Pharaoh just keeps trying to like, then at one point, I want to see if I can find it on my notes. This would be good. Um, at one point, Pharaoh is so overwhelmed that he actually confesses his sin. Like, okay, this is the livestock one. Pharaoh is so overwhelmed at one point that, that he brings Moses in and he says, I have sinned against God. Please forgive me. Make it go away. <laughs> but what Pharaoh does, he as soon as the plague goes away, then all of a sudden, do you know what he does? His heart, his heart gets hard again. Because Pharaoh wanted the freedom without the repentance, just the confession. Right? He confesses. That's just saying I've done wrong. Repentance means to turn the other way. So Pharaoh confesses, but he doesn't repent. He, he confesses just enough to make the pain go away, but he doesn't repent to make the whole problem go away. And that's part of God's invitation for us to trust Him. Not just to, to admit that we need freedom, not just to confess the things that we've done wrong, but to trust His plan for repentance, for redemption. So over and over and over and over again, 
God is calling out to Israel. God is calling out to Egypt. Plague after plague. It gets worse and worse. More and more lives are being affected. More and more crops are being destroyed. More and more things are dying. And Pharaoh's disobedience in his hard heart. Friends, many of us know what this is like, don't we? Either it's happened in our lives or it's happened to people around us. Where people persist in their brokenness. Continue to live in fear and anxiety and addiction. And then it begins to get harder and harder and harder for them and for the people around them. And the Egyptians, it's interesting, the Egyptians realized what was going on and they actually began to blame Pharaoh himself. They realized it was Pharaoh that was holding them hostage to all these plagues. God, in his love, in his grace, by his plan, he's making things harder on purpose for Egypt so that A, his glory might be revealed and B, so that Pharaoh would have to answer the question fully and finally, will you trust me? Will you let my people go? And then we get all the way to Exodus chapter 11 and we're gonna leave it here because this is God's final warning. It's God's most significant and final warning to both Egypt and to Israel that the plan is coming to its end that the final plague is coming. God, again, out of love and of grace, like, think about this. God didn't have to tell Pharaoh about any of the plagues that were coming. God didn't have to warn him. God didn't have to take those extra plagues away each time. Right? Imagine if it was a compounding of the ten plagues and it just kept on going, right? More blood, more frogs, more gnats, more flies. It just keeps going and going and going. Each time, God relents. God relents and he gets all the way to the end out of an incredible grace and compassion. He shares his final warning. And we're going to pick this up next week in Exodus chapter 11. But over and over and over and over again, there's a call and a response. A call and a response. God is calling out to his people Israel. God is calling out to Egypt, God is calling out to Pharaoh and he's asking the question, will you trust me? And Pharaoh's heart kept getting harder and harder and harder. So my question for you is the same question that I believe God asked Israel. It's the same question that I believe God asked Moses. It's the same question that I believe God asked Aaron. It's the same question that I believe God asked Egypt and Pharaoh. Will you trust God? Will you trust God's plan? Will you trust God's personhood? Will you trust God's power? Will you trust the partners that God puts in your life to help bring you freedom? Will you partner with God to help bring freedom to others? As we enter into this journey of freedom together, that's going to be the first question I'm going to ask you to wrestle with in your life groups this week. It's going to be the first question I'm going to ask you to wrestle with personally. Will you trust him? His plan. Can we pray? God, you know each story that is represented in this room. God, you know each hurt and hang up and worry and fear and addiction and brokenness. Not only do you know each story in this room, you know each story of the seven billion plus people on this planet. You are the God who literally spoke being into existence.
And even when we doubt, God, even when we complain, like Moses and Israel did, you're gracious to us. You continue to extend your love, the hope, the healing that only you can bring. You keep asking us this question, this unrelenting question. Will you trust me? So Father, for those in this room that are still waiting, for those of us today that are still waiting for that freedom, give us the courage to trust your plan, to trust your person, to trust your power, to trust your partnership. Amen. This thought came to my mind as I was praying and before I let you go. Um, one of the reasons we find it so hard to trust God for the freedom that we need in our lives is that we can't imagine our lives without the bondage. We can't imagine what, what our relationships would be like, what our, what our families would be like, what we would be like without that thing that is holding us bondage. And so I'm going to challenge you. Would you ask God for a picture or a vision for what your life could look like without being in bondage? Would you ask God for a, a fresh picture, a fresh vision, a fresh understanding in this coming week of what your life could look like free? Because some of us, have, we've been in bondage for so long that we can't even imagine what it would like to be free, just like Israel. So that's my challenge for you this week. As you, as you wrestle with that question, will you trust God? Would you ask him for a vision, a picture, an understanding, an idea of what your life could be like? Free, without bondage. That's my prayer for you. Blessings. Oh, peace. Thank you.